Would, uh, from the other side, Russian Russians view Transnistrians as being Russians? Are the cultural bonds that deep, the cultural similarities, the language, the religion, etc.? So basically, Russia was perceiving Transnistria always as a, a Trojan horse, which, while reintegrated to Moldova, would serve as an anchor, which will keep Moldova where it is. And this is why Russia never recognized Transnistria as a separate state. Because if Russia would do this, it, not only it will lose its anchor, it will also create a lot of mess and problem because um, Transnistria separated from Moldova would require even more economical assistance from Russia. And it's still existing only because of Russian, uh, Russian assistance. Hello, my name is Nicholas Furnival. You are watching or listening to an OSW interview. Today I'll be talking to Kamil Tsaus, an expert from OSW's Belarus, Ukraine and Moldova department. Today we'll be discussing Moldova's breakaway Transnistria region, a holdover from the period of Soviet expansion. Okay, so before we begin, we need to go through how politically correct we're going to be. So this place called Transnistria, from the perspective of Chisinau, the capital of Moldova, it's simply a region. But the authorities in Tiraspol believe that it's a country. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, authorities in Chisinau actually quite often refrain to use the name Transnistria. It's correct, you can use it. But they prefer to use the term left bank of the Nistru River, simply like that, or the territory on the left bank of the Nistru River. Um, sometimes they are referring to it as a separatist region um, of Moldova. But in general, uh, this is how it works. Kishinev perceives it as a inherent region, integral part of Moldova. And the authorities in Tiraspol consider themselves to be independent state, full-fledged state. Mm -hmm. But they are um, the only one, basically. Nobody in the world uh, recognized them as a state. Well, that was my next question. So nobody. <laughs> well, not fully nobody. It's a little bit more uh, complicated as uh, in most cases regarding international law. So there is no state which is recognized by the United Nations which recognize Transnistria as a state. Because Transnistria is recognized by certain non-recognized international actors. Such as, uh, such as Abkhazia, for example, or South Ossetia. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think it's quite important to say that Russia does not recognize... The Russia definitely does not recognize uh, Transnistria. In its official narrative, uh, Russia perceives Transnistria as a part of Moldova. Of course, very special part. Um, but yeah, technically speaking, Russia d do not recognize Transnistria as an independent entity. Okay, so the next uh, the next um, point to move on to, you already mentioned uh, Moldova often refer, the authorities in Chisinau often refer to it as the left bank of the Dniester River. The name Transnistria means across... Beyond the Dniester, across the Dniester River, yeah. exactly. So where exactly would that place it internationally? Uh, which countries does it border? Is it landlocked, etc.? Uh, well, Transnistria is a territory, very slim territory. Usually uh, it's it's... Width is around 30 kilometers, and it's about, if I remember correctly, 150 kilometers long from north to south and 30 kilometers from east to west or west to east. Uh, it's located between the eastern border of Moldova, so border of between Ukraine and Moldova, I mean, in the international terms, and between the Nistru River uh, and, and at the bank of the Nistru River. The... Only territory of Transnistria, which actually um, is located on the right bank of the Nistru River, the only significant part of the territory is in the city of Bender or Tigina in Romania. Um, it's the uh, second largest uh, city in Transnistria. Um, uh, so, yes, it's on the it's on the way from Kishinev to Tiraspol. OK, so now the slightly more advanced questions begin. Uh, we do want to get to the current situation, but... How did it happen that this very slender piece of territory trapped between Ukraine and Moldova exists? Uh, what's the origin story of it? So to make long story short, because it's a really long story, which would start probably somewhere in the 18th century. Uh, let's start from perestroika period, from 1980s uh, in, the, in the Soviet Union. So basically speaking, when... Mikhail Gorbachev started to introduce his reforms in the Soviet Union, like Perestroika and Glasnost. Um, in numerous Soviet republics, different national movements, national revival movements started to appear. Right in Moldova, the situation was quite peculiar because uh, 
there was not uh, there was none uh, no, no Moldovan national revival movement as such. Uh, it was rather Romanian national revival movement. Those were the people, particularly uh, writers, poets, and people of culture representing culture. Um, who are claiming that Moldovans are Romanians and they are a member of the white Romanian nation and they should therefore uh, revive their identity as a Romanians. At the same time, this attitude was warring people living on the left bank of the Dniester River, so in Transnistria. And now why? Well, because this region always was a little bit different than the rest of the country. It was inhabited mostly by the Slavic uh, Russian, speaking, uh, Russian speakers. If um, uh, the ethnic structure of the uh, right bank of the Nistru River, so the main part of Republic of Moldova, uh, was about, it was about 70% was, uh, was represented by the Moldovans, Uh, and the rest were Slavs. In Transnistria, it was the other way around. So about 70% uh, were uh, Russians, Ukrainians, and about 30% was uh, represented by Moldovans, and the rest were Gagals, Bulgarians, Jews, Poles, and so on and so forth. Uh, so those people were worried that Moldova can become Romanized, that Moldova, that they, without knowledge of the Romanian language, um, can become uh, citizens of the like, second-class citizens, second-hand citizens, let's say. Uh, and those fears were used by uh, another very interesting, let's say, social group in Transnistria. And this, this group was called uh, the Red Directorate. And those were the managers, the directors of the local heavy industry, uh, power plant, steel mill, uh, concrete factory, and so on and so forth. Those managers were usually sent the, from the, by the Soviet authorities from different regions in the Soviet Union. They were mostly mm-hmm. Slavs as well, Russians or Ukrainians. And of course, they were people of, they were people of power. Uh, they were l- living a good life with a uh, lot of privileges, relatively a lot of money as for the uh, Soviet Union and well they were not interested in losing it at all uh, and they were afraid also that if Moldova would be Romanizing uh, they without knowledge of Romanian language without being ethnic Moldovans they would not be able to retain their positions so they started to use those fears which yeah were the, uh, among the general public uh, for the political reasons and of course There's the second, the third tier, which is the, the most important one, and it was Moscow, and it was Kremlin, which seen what is happening, and which wanted to actually f- uh, fuel those tensions and fuel this rising separatism in Transnistria uh, for its own for its own good to actually stop uh, this this Romanization movement, which was taking place in in the Republic of Moldova, um, or in the Moldovan uh, Soviet Socialist Republic back then. Uh, So those tensions were rising uh, up until 1990, uh, when uh, Transnistria actually decided to declare independence, which is interesting. It wasn't independence per se. It wasn't uh, independence um, on the, let's say, global level. It was independence from Moldova within the Soviet Union. So basically, Transnistria declared themselves to be independent Soviet Socialist Republic, Just like I know, Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, Russian Federal Socialist Soviet Socialist Republic, and so on and so forth. Uh, this decision was not recognized not only by Kishinev but also even by Moscow. Uh, but it's only uh, fueled additionally fueled those tensions which were rising, and it all ended up in open military conflict, which uh, started uh, fully in 1992. It's conflict between uh, forces loyal to the Kishinev and uh, forces loyal to authorities in Tiraspol and to Moscow. And how involved was Moscow in this open military conflict? Well, it was it has decisive uh, it was a decisive factor. So Transnistrian forces comprised mostly of the so-called Transnistrian guards, so uh, like the local forces uh, uh, a little bit there, there was also militia, there were some veterans there, there were some some soldiers who were serving in the local structures. Uh, but the main Fourth, the decisive factor in the end of the day was the 14th Russian army, Soviet and then Russian army, because it's 1992, it's already after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which took part in the conflict on side of the Transnistrian separatists. And thanks to the uh, involvement of Russians, uh, 
Transnistrians managed to actually fight Moldovans back and to retain this de facto independence from the Republic of Moldova. It was a short conflict. It's called uh, it's called Summer War, uh, summer of 1992. It took about six months tops. It really started in the end of 1991 with some small skirmishes, uh, usually between some militia and, uh, and on the Transnistrian side and some... Uh, voluntary units from the Moldovan side. But then it it escalated to the full fledged conflict in the, in the next months between March, particular between March and June uh, 1992. Uh, it was quite limited conflict as well. About 1,000 people uh, are considered casualties of this conflict. Okay, so the war ended in a ceasefire, and the ceasefire more or less leads us to the present day because it's been over 30 years with the ceasefire. This is the state of relations between Moldova and its, let's say, breakaway republic. Yeah, on the other hand, it's quite interesting uh, to see that those, the ceasefire wasn't signed between Moldova and Transnistria, because Transnistria is not an actor. Uh, it was signed between Moldova and Russia. Uh, which is quite interesting, given the fact that Russia has claimed that it wasn't really involved in this conflict. I mean, yeah, Russia... So this means at the moment there is a ceasefire in place between uh, Russia and Moldova. Uh, well, Russia wasn't a part of the conflict. I mean, Russia was not waging war with Moldova. Uh, Russia considered themselves to be itself to be uh, like a peacekeeper in this in this whole conflict. So Russia stopped this, their own narrative again. Russia stopped the bloodshed, and this is why Russia signed this. Well, not a ceasefire as such. It's like an agreement, basically, regarding uh, regulating the presence of Russian peace, so-called peacekeepers on the territory of Transnistria and so on and so forth, and actually forming this whole peacekeeping mission on the territory of Moldova. So it's more like that. On the other hand, uh, you mentioned that um, Transnistria wanted to be independent within the Soviet Union. Yes. <laughs> and things changed with the Soviet Union quite yes. dramatically. Yeah. But uh, I believe that Transnistria uh, claims to have two flags. And I saw one has the hammer and sickle on it, and the other just appears to be the flag of Russia. Yes. <laughs> are they are they somehow lost in time? Well, when so basically, if you look on the, ma uh, the map, if you look on the flag of uh, Transnistria today, it's nothing more and nothing less than the flag of Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic. It's the same flag. So this is a flag that MSSR was using in the communist times. Hammer and sickle was there because it was communist times, but then it's not really necessary. You can use it on the official flag of Transnistria, but you don't really need to. And at some point, actually, it was even not recommended to use it. Uh, it's more, more or less for the sentimental purposes. It's those... Three bars, red, green, and uh, red again. This is the official flag of Transnistria and the most popular one. Um, when it comes to Russian flag, uh, yeah, a few years ago, the uh, Transnistrian authorities decided to elevate the uh, status of a Russian flag, which always was very high. I mean, Russian, you, you could fly a Russian flag in anywhere in Transnistria, and that would be totally fine. But they elevated the status of the flag to a flag which is equal to the uh, official flag of Transnistria. It's not the Transnistrian flag because obviously, I mean, it's not the Transnistrian flag, but it can be, it can fly right next to the Transnistrian flag. They both represent the same. And this is because Transnistrians, and I'm talking both about the government, uh, the official government, uh, and the uh, general Transnistrian population, they perceive themselves as a part of the so-called Ruski Mir, Russian world. Uh, so this Russian cultural language, uh, common space, and they basically see themselves as uh, disattached uh, members of the Russian state. Okay, and would, uh, from the other side, Russian Russians, we could say, people from Moscow, St. Petersburg, view Transnistrians as being Russians? Are the cultural bonds that deep, the cultural similarities, the language, the religion, etc.? And you're asking about the people, not about the uh, politicians, not about the Kremlin. I would, I would like to ask about both. Okay, fact. so let's start from the general population, so general public, uh, Russian general public. Uh, I would say yes, yes. Uh, Russian uh, propaganda, Russian TV channels are presenting Transnistrians as uh, people in Transnistria as members of the um, wide Russian, again, Ruski Mir, wide Russian cultural space. Not to mention that about 30% of those who actually are living in Transnistria are ethnic Russians. And right now about 150,000 people in Transnistria, which is about half of population in the, of this region, like the real population, because official data are higher, but uh, that, that, that's the, the real population is about 300,000 people. They have 
Russian passports. So they are also Russian citizens. Um, so yeah, I think that most of Russians would not have any doubts about uh, Transnistrians being, people of Transnistria being member of the Russian people, let's say. You know, in Russian, you've got two different words to describe Russians. You've got word Ruski, which refers technically to the ethnic Russians. If you were born from Russian mother and, and Russian father, or at least one of them, where or you have some other roots, you are Ruski. You also can be... Which Ras- would be basically ethnic Russian. Ethnic Russian, and, exactly, and... exactly. At the same time, you can be Rasianin, which means Russian as well, but it refers to the citizenship. Uh, it means the citizen of the Russian, uh, of the Russian state. Uh, it comes from the word Rasia, right? Russia. Uh, It's usually quite mixed. So uh, most of Russians would refer to uh, most of citizens of Russia as Ruski, unless they do not like, not, they do not seem seem to be Slavic. Well, I'm talking about uh, outside look, let's say, right? Uh, if you are Slav, if you are white, you'll be easy Russia, uh, Ruski. And the same. So th- this refers also to this refers also to the people living in Transnistria. I mean, most of them, uh, be it Ukrainian, be it Russian, be it Moldovans, they look similar. They look the same, and they all basically speak Russian. They lean towards Moscow. They lean to Russian culture. They lean to Pushkin. They lean to you know Dostoevsky and so on and so forth. They watch. Russian news channels, so they are in the mm, under the influence of the Russian propaganda. So definitely, they are part of uh, of the wider Russian nation, be it Ruski or Rasiski. And from the point of view of the government, well, here situation is quite uh, different. I mean, yeah, uh, and let's uh, l- l- let's let's make this one disclaimer. We'll be right now talking about the situation before the current war started, uh, because it will be easier. Then we can uh, move. To, to how the situation evolved. Uh, before, uh, so, so basically from Russian perspective, from the authorities' perspective, yes, of course, Transnistrians are members of the Ruski Mir of the Russian world. They are ra- culturally Russians. But is Transnistria part of uh, Russia or should be part of Russia? Um, not really. From Russian perspective, official perspective, Transnistria is part of Moldova. No questions about this. It is part of Moldova. It should remain part of Moldova, but of course under special conditions uh, dictated by the by the Kremlin. Uh, from the very beginning of this conflict, I mean, from 90s, uh, Russia would like to see Transnistria reintegrated into the Republic of Moldova again to become not only not only the Euro but also de facto part of the state, uh, but of course with special rights. Uh, Russia would like to see Moldova federalized, with Transnistria being member subject of the federation, with uh, veto rights toward uh, foreign policy of Moldova. The idea was to have Transnistria, very much pro-Russian region, inhabited mostly by Slavs or Russian speakers and so on and so forth, so forth, member of federation with Moldova, member which will be stopping Moldova from any attempt to integrate with European Union, any other Western structure uh, to uh, stop Moldova from leaving uh, Commonwealth of Independent States, for example, and so on and so forth. So basically, Russia was perceiving Transnistria always as a Trojan Trojan horse uh, perspective, a Trojan horse, which, while reintegrated to Moldova, would serve as an anchor which will keep Moldova where it is. And this is why Russia never recognized Moldo- uh, Transnistria as a separate state. Because if Russia would do this, it will lose this this, this anchor. It, not only it will lose this anchor, it will also create a lot of mess and problem because um, Transnistria separated from Moldova would require even more economical assistance from Russia. And it's still existing only because of Russian uh, Russian assistance. Uh, so Russia was never really official. Official Moscow was never really interested in uh, in recognizing Transnistria as an independent, uh, independent entity. And they never did it even after war, uh, the current war, uh, the full-fledged war with Ukraine started. Okay. So I was, I was going to say that's a good segue from Russia behaving in a very subtle way to Russia's definitely non-subtle behavior in its full-scale invasion of Ukraine last year. So this, as we discussed before, brought Moldova almost to center stage and really made us notice that Transnistria is there. Uh, To my understanding, the people of Transnistria aren't really limited by being surrounded by Ukraine and Moldova. There's very easy freedom of movement. But has this been changing? Have they... 
Have they found limitations to their freedom because of the war in Ukraine? Yes, they did. Uh, before war, uh, as you said, basically they could travel freely uh, both to Ukraine and uh, further to Russia, for example, or to Republic of Moldova. There are no border controls on the Moldovan side. Uh, there is, of course, a border control uh, run by Transnistrians. If When you're leaving Transnistria um, to Moldova, uh, of course, in quotation marks, um, but Moldovans would not check you unless you will be leaving Moldova proper. Uh, right now, the situation changed uh, because tra- Ukraine closed the border with Transnistria uh, when the war started. Uh, so Transnistrians cannot travel to Ukraine. They cannot travel to Russia via Ukraine. There are actually buses running from Tiraspol through Moldova, Romania, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, up to the Baltic states and to Russia. So it's quite a long trip. So if you would like to go to Moscow from <laughs> Tiraspol now, it's possible, but it will take you two days. And quite a lot of money. Okay. Um, so this is, the, this is the first thing. Plus there are certain other limitations which were introduced not only because of the war, also a little bit earlier regarding a movement of cars. Uh, Transnistria uh, have its own license plate system and they are recognized. Those license plates right now are recognized basically only in Moldova proper. So if you are going from Transnistria to Moldova proper, so to the left, uh, right bank of the uh, Nistru River, Yeah, you can move freely on those plates. You can use the documents um, which are which are uh, proving that you are a holder, I mean, owner of this car. But you would not leave Moldova. Uh, if you would like to leave Moldova, you would need to have so-called. Uh, neutral license plates. And this is a new, quite a new thing introduced just a few years ago. So Moldova said, guys, you can have those fancy license plates of yours if you do uh, if you don't want to have ours but we will be issuing them and uh, we will be in control of the database of registered cars and so on and so forth so and uh, and plus we will have our own offices issuing those license plates in Transnistria and we will be running this yeah together with you but we will be controlling the situation so a few years ago Moldovans actually launched those those offices and those license plates they are neutral because they do not bear any s- symbols of state on the on the old typical transnistrian uh, license plate you have a transnistrian flag and of course it's unacceptable from the moldovan perspective when you're living living moldova you cannot really use them uh, so those new license plates are quite similar to british actually i mean they just have This is a white plate with um, black uh, letters and nothing else, like large black letters and numbers. That's it. Oh, we still retain the uh, the UK symbol on one side of them. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. A, but a throwback uh, to our previous you, uh, you alignment. Know, you know what I mean? Yeah, you don't. And if you, the original thing is that when you're leaving Moldova uh, with those neutral plates, you need to put a sticker with MD letters on your car. Because there's there are no those there are no letters on the license plates as such, so you need to have them on your car. Um, It's a, stu- a two stage process to getting Moldovan plates. In other it, words, yeah, it is, it is, <laughs> it is, it is. But uh, that's basically the only limitation, and uh, not to mention that almost every citizen of Transnistria is entitled to Moldovan passports to have Moldovan citizenship. And if you will, ha- you are you are a holder of Moldovan passport, you can freely uh, move wherever you like. Not th- no through the Ukrainian Moldovan border on this on this uh, Transnistrian um, uh, segment of border because of course it's closed because of war. But in general, that's how it works. Okay, uh, I would like to ask also about the complications with energy. Um, we don't want to go into too much detail, but it was reasonably complicated. So after the Ukraine war, there were pretty strong disagreements, and some people called it an energy war between. Moldova and Transnistria. Yes, maybe we should start from um, from uh, one important statement. So up until war started, or maybe not even the war when war started, when Russia started, to, when Russia appeared to be weaker than we thought, and uh, Russia failed to actually succeed in this war. Uh, up until this moment, Moldova was very careful when it came to its relation with Transnistria. Moldova is always afraid, not without uh, reason, of course, that uh, if it will be too aggressive toward Transnistria, it can prompt retaliation from the Russian side. And 
in in a different in in any possible shape or form. Uh, now it's quite obvious that Russia cannot do really too much uh, to punish Moldova for 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 its policy or uh, uh, its policy towards towards Transnistria. So this energy, so-called energy war, is actually a great example of that. Uh, the state of play is like that. Uh, Transnistria is home for the largest power plant in the region, so-called Moldavska Gris, uh, or the Moldovan Gris. Uh, it's a huge power plant built in the Soviet times. Uh, it was designated to, it, it was created to actually feed the energy to the Moldovan Soviet Socialist Republic, part of Ukraine, and even export some part of this energy to Romania. Uh, now this power plant serves mostly for Transnistria proper, which which well it requires certain amount of energy because of the industry but still it's a very small region and for the better ta- part of the last 30 years it was also providing most of the electricity to right bank moldova about 80% of the consumption of the entire right bank moldova was actually coming from this moldavska gas power plant and this moldavska gas power plant is uh, fired by with gas gas which transnistria receives from russia from gazprom for free which is quite important because thanks to that... It's a very price, strong lever. Yeah, it is, it is very, yeah, that's true. It's very strong lever and the, it, it, it allows Transnistrian authorities, first of all, to offer very competitive price, let's say, uh, to, to Moldova. Plus, it generates... Uh, enormous revenues for the local budget. I mean, if you're producing energy and then you're selling this energy, and but you're producing it basically almost for free, then, well, you're retaining all the profits and you can use those money to uh, uh, help to, to, to keep your b- budget balanced because that's a huge, that, that's a big deal and that's a large problem when it comes to uh, transition economy. Um, which way did the gas pipelines run? Because uh, Transnistria has no border with Russia. So I, yeah. I assume they would the supplies were disrupted. It runs through Ukraine, then to Transnistria, and then to Moldova proper, and further further south, it's so-called Transbalkan pipeline. It's a huge pipeline, also built in the Soviet times. And yeah, it was th- that was the uh, entire beginning of a problem. Uh, at some point, Gazprom decided to limit the amount of gas which was transferred through this pipeline to Transnistria and to Moldova and further south. And the argumentation um, provided by Gazprom was that uh, it's, of course, all because of Ukraine, that Ukraine is not allowing Gazprom to transfer gas through the old route, which was usually used by uh, by it to by this company to, to, to sell gas to Moldova and to other countries. Ukraine responded by saying that, guys, we can't really allow you to use the old route because this route runs through the territory which we are not in control of, uh, so-called Donetsk and Lugansk People Republic. You can, however, use the alternative route, which is a little bit further north. Uh, those territories are still under our control. We are in control of the compression, so-called compression station, uh, which is located there, which uh, ex- like kind of accept the gas from your side. And that will be fine. I mean, its uh, capacity of this connection is quite high. We'll retain the same amount of gas uh, we were sending south, 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 southwards uh, as before. But Gazprom did not accept this, uh, this offer, obviously, and at some point started to limit the amount of gas um, uh, sent to Moldova and to another, another um, countries. Um, and this caused this crisis which you were referring to. At some point, Moldova, it was in October, November and December last year, Moldova, Moldova was getting only about 70, 50 and then 40 percent of the gas which it should get from Gazprom because of those limitations. And because of those limitations, also Transnistria, which gets gas from Gazprom based on the contract signed by Moldova, get less gas than it should. Mm -hmm. And in October uh, 2022, uh, authorities in Tiraspol said, well, in this situation, we need to limit the production of electricity uh, because we don't have enough gas to produce enough power for us and for our Moldovan colleagues. And uh, in response to that, Moldovans say, guys, I mean, you're getting this gas. Uh, f- first of all, it's Gazprom who is creating problems. Secondly, you're getting this gas thanks to agreement we signed. So either you will be providing us with enough gas, uh, enough um, electric power, or you won't get any gas at all. 
And that's the first time in history when Moldova actually decided to use the fact that they are the one who are controlling the gouges. And uh, they are the one who actually can cut gas supplies to, to Transnistria. Before that, I believe none government in Kishinev would allow itself to cut gas supplies to Transnistria because they would be afraid that Russia would retaliate, that Russia would cut gas supplies from Moldova proper and so on and so forth. But the situation changed thanks to the fact that Moldova right now can, first of all, um, uh, get gas from different sources, um, from from Romanian side. It can get sources from... Um, uh, it can get gas from the from the underground storage facilities in Ukraine and Romania, which were filled um, uh, during the summertime also by, by, by Moldova. Um, so this allowed actually to play this this game called energy war also by somebody, some some people uh, between Transnistria and, uh, and Moldova. It all ended up in December when uh, Moldova decided to leave entire amount of gas which it gets from Gazprom, still limited, to Transnistria and use gas from different sources for its own needs. And therefore, Moldova is right now buying electricity for this very competitive price uh, from Transnistria. It's not using really Russian gas. It's using a gas ball from other sources and... Uh, in- indirectly. Store it in- exactly. It exactly. still has the good deal. Yeah. Okay. So some things are changing. Uh, Um, Moldova is able to be more assertive towards Transnistria. But there has been a ceasefire for the last 30 years. What scale of changes should we expect over the next 30 years or the next three years? Um, Honestly, I would say that I don't believe there will be another 30 years of Transnistria. Um, Before full-fledged war started in February 2022, uh, yeah, I'll probably admit that nothing would change in the foreseeable future because the situation is not only stable, but first of all, there are certain political forces uh, also in Moldova, and I'm not talking about the ruling uh, party right now, but there are other parties who are interested in retaining situation as it is and who are actually earning quite a lot of money on that, um, particularly the politicians from, from those parties. Uh, but now the situation is different. Uh, if Ukraine will, will win this war, and by winning I mean we, Ukraine will retain independence and will remain pro-Western, uh, which probably would, would be the end um, uh, end scenario, uh, Transnistria will have a very hard time to actually function on the basis which in, on which it was functioned before. Uh, to be honest, one of the most important f- issues which allowed Transnistria to operate, which allowed Transnistrian economy to maybe not flourish, but, uh, but at least to, 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 to keep up, uh, was the fact that Ukraine was not really doing too much to limit uh, Transnistrian economic freedom to to help Moldova get rid of the problem of Transnistria. There were certain people, particularly in the Odessa region, also linked to the authorities or linked to the custom services, who were earning quite a lot of money uh, on cooperation with Transnistria. Uh, so corruption, like in general speaking, corruption was the reason why a lot of people in the government of Ukraine on, on the local level also were interested in retaining the situation as it is. Right now, it's not the case anymore. Uh, Ukraine is aware that it's uh, very much a threat for the, for the state, that it needs to be solved out, and the Transnistria needs to be subjugated under authority of Kishinev. Again, that Russian troops, which are there, there are not too many of them, it's about 1,500 people, but still, they need to get out from Transnistria, and basically that's it. So, with current authorities in Kishinev, which are very much pro-Western and very much focused on solving Transnistrian issue and which are not really participating in any uh, corrupt schemes regarding Transnistria, and with Ukraine, which is very much willing to solve the whole problem, uh, it will be quite easy to force authorities in Tiraspol to actually cooperate with Moldova, to get into the legal fields of Moldova. And it's, it's, it's actually happening already. Uh, Transnistria is more and more integrated when it comes to economy into the Moldovan uh, wider Moldovan space. Transnistria is 
exporting most of its goods, whether I'm talking about about 60 to up to 70 percent, either to Republic of Moldova proper or to the European Union. Russia is just about 10 percent of the whole export. The only problem which is which need to be solved and which which uh, is Keeping Transnistria where it is is not really a Russian army there, but uh, the fact that Russian that the Transnistrian economy still operates thanks to this free gas which Transnistria gets gets from Russia. Moldova and probably the western parts of Moldova need to figure out some way to actually keep Transnistrian economy running without this Russian gas, uh, to keep it competitive without Russian gas, and if that will happen. Probably it will be even easier to uh, find some common ground with the local authorities, which are not only linked to Russia, but which are, first of all, linked to their own pockets. And I'm right now talking about Sheriff uh, Holding, the company, a huge company, which is um, uh, basically running the entire economy of this region and which is linked to Kremlin, of course. But first of all, it's interested in its own profits. If we'll be able to allow them to actually keep at least part of those profits, then it will be probably easier to uh, have them on the right side, on the bright side of on our side of this whole conflict. Uh, which is also the right side of the Dniester River. True. <laughs> <laughs> Although still physically on the left. <laughs> okay, so Camille, thank you very much for explaining in very easy to understand terms, a very difficult topic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for watching this OSW interview. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe to our channel to help us reach a wider audience.